is Darren Hardy, and I'm the publisher of Success Magazine. First off, I want to congratulate you. If you are listening to this audio, it means you have made the first step towards your better future. You have decided to become an entrepreneur. Bravo. When I asked Donald Trump what the number one key to wealth was, he said, own your own business. Now, I know you might still be unsure, uneasy, wondering if this is really for you. You were probably thinking, did I make the right decision? Is this really for me? Sure, this might have worked out for others, but I'm not sure I can do it. You might think, I'm not like that guy or gal. I don't have the skills. I don't know the right people. I don't have the time, etc., etc. Just know, those thoughts are natural. Everyone feels those very same things when they're first getting started. And during this audio, I will ease every one of those concerns for you and empower you with the skills and the mindset to be fantastically successful as an entrepreneur. Here's a little known secret about the most successful people in the world. First of all, they were all once a newbie, just like you, just getting started. And secondly, they all felt nervous, uneasy, if not downright scared and terrified in the beginning. Yes, this includes Sir Richard Branson, Donald J. Trump, Dr. Mehmet Oz, Maria Shriver, Tony Hawk, Anthony Hopkins, and many others I've had a chance to meet and interview. So, you are in good company. So, if you feel any of those things, know that it is okay and part of the process. It will soon subside. But, I also want to warn you, when you feel those types of feelings, your mind can start playing tricks on you to quote-unquote protect you. It will start inventing all kinds of things that are wrong with the business or the people or your circumstances, whatever, to give you a solid justification to why you will decide not to move forward with the business. So please hear my warning. It will happen. But now you can call out this covert tactic of your mind and keep it from sidelining you and the bigger dreams and goals that you have for your life. Take comfort in knowing this. The business that you have decided to sign up for Thousands of people have already done it successfully, with less going on for them than you have. No excuse your mind can conjure up is valid. Those are just fear-induced protection tactics. Don't buy into them. And again, welcome to your exciting entrepreneurial future. I can't wait for you to look back three to five years from now and say, I can remember when I first got started, how I felt and what battles of the mind I had to fight. But boy, I'm glad I did. Now, look at my home, my family, this lifestyle, these pictures from our last several vacations, how great my kids are doing, how much I'm able to support my church, friends, and my extended family. I am so glad that I pushed myself through those first several days as I made the shift. And that is what I want to help you do to make the shift, the shift to the entrepreneur mindset. Let's first talk about the variables involved in your being successful in the business you decided to join. Before I start anything, I like to evaluate all the variable success factors. What separates why one person might be successful at something and another one not? What factor or factors determine the difference? There are four. Let's evaluate them together. One is the company and the leadership. Does the company you joined have different policies and procedures for Ivy League college graduates than for high school dropouts? Are Republicans given special incentives that Democrats aren't? Are Christians held to terms and conditions that are different from Jews? No? Well, then the company is the same for everyone, so that isn't a variable. How about the products and services? Do they ship different products into rich neighborhoods than they do poor ones? Do they offer VIP products exclusively available based on your social status, political connections, or family background? If everyone has the same products and services to work with, then that is not a differentiating variable either. Okay, then how about the compensation plan? This is where there is sure to be an inequity, right? Is there a faster ascension plan for white people versus black people? Are there special bonuses paid to men that women don't get? How about older people with families? Are they paid more than single people just out of college? No? Well, isn't that fabulous? This is truly the great equal opportunity employer. The playing field is completely level. 
everyone has exactly the same variables to work with. And since the company is already successful, the product already selling, and the compensation plan already paying people an inordinate amount of money, none of those are variables at all. They are all proven. So what then is the only remaining X factor? There is only one thing that will determine your success or failure in this business. There is only one thing that will determine the level of your success in this business. And that is you. You are the X factor. And that is the point of this audio. I want to help you work on you to make the shift, obtain the entrepreneur mindset to become the person you need to become in order to achieve the success you seek in owning your own business. A level of success so great, in fact, you might not have even dared possible for yourself before. Before we jump into the tough work of how to work on you, we need to address your core motivation for doing so. We have to address your why. Here's what I know for sure. Without a strong enough why, you will never do the how of what it takes to make the shift and to succeed in your own business. In my book, The Compound Effect, I talk about the fact that the will to do something is not enough. Willpower will fail you, as it has before most every diet, new discipline, or New Year's resolution that you've set. What you need now is why power. You need why power to make the entrepreneur shift. Here is why. The power of your why is what gets you to stick through the grueling, mundane, and laborious. All of the hows will be meaningless and seemingly insurmountable until your whys are powerful enough. Until you set your desire and motivation in place, you'll abandon any new path that you seek to a better life. If your why power, your desire, isn't great enough, if the fortitude of your commitment isn't powerful enough, You'll end up like every other person who starts a new diet or signs up for a new business opportunity and gives up too quickly and reverts back to their unfulfilling patterns of their old life. Don't let that be you. Let me give you an analogy to help bring this concept home. Imagine me putting a 10-inch wide, 30-foot long plank on the ground and saying, if you walk the length of the plank, I'll give you $20. Would you do it? Of course, it's an easy 20 bucks. But what if I took that same plank and made a rooftop bridge between two 100-story buildings? If I still offered you the 20 bucks for walking across the plank, would you do it now? Likely, you'd say, no way, Buster. However, imagine if your child was on the opposite building, and that building was on fire, the flames licking at their neck, and if you didn't walk across the plank to save them, they would certainly perish and die. Would you walk the length of the plank now? Without question and immediately, you do it, 20 bucks or not. Now, why is it that the first time I asked you to cross that sky-high plank, you'd say no way, yet the second time, you wouldn't hesitate? The risks and the dangers were the same. What changed? Your why changed. Your reason for wanting to do it. You see, when the reason or the why is big enough, you will be willing to perform almost any how. To truly ignite your creative potential and your inner drive, you have to look beyond the motivation of monetary and material goals. It's not that those motivations are bad. In fact, they're great. I'm a connoisseur of nice things, too. But material stuff can't really recruit your heart, soul, and guts into battle. That passion has to come from a deeper place. So, the first thing I want to challenge you to do is to discover your why. Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Why do you want to earn more money? Is it to send your children to the best universities around the world? Is it to contribute to your church? Is it to buy your parents a home so they don't have to worry about their financial future? Do you want to travel, owe no one anything, have complete and utter financial independence and peace of mind? What are you willing to fight for, work day and night for? What are you willing to walk across that 100-story high plank for? What you are looking to unearth in yourself is your passion. In my opinion, and the opinion of many of the most successful business leaders on the planet, this is the single most important discovery you can make in yourself, the discovery of your personal passion. It will be the fuel for your entrepreneurial engine. It will breathe life into your goals, dreams, and ambitions. All right, now that we know, it will be your why power that will power your engine. 
and it will be the emotional force of your passion that will fuel your engine as you drive forward, I now need to help you avoid what I call the five hidden landmines of entrepreneurial and business startup. So, I'm going to map out these five landmines and give you the mindset shift you need to make in order to navigate around them. number one, success factors. Everything you've worked hard to accumulate up till now is useless. I don't mean to say it so bluntly, but you really need to hear this. I know that it sounds harsh, but it's the truth. I'm trying to help you avoid a landmine here. To do so, I can't pull any punches. I have to give it to you straight or you might roll right onto a bomb that you didn't even see under your feet. All the education you have accumulated your resume, all the awards you've collected, the titles you've reached during your ladder climbing ascent, all of those are worthless to you being successful as an entrepreneur. In fact, I will go as far as to say those success factors will be your greatest inhibitors to your being able to be successful in this field. Why? Primarily because you have spent the last 10, 20, 30, even 40 or 50 years relying on those developed strengths. Your success was based on how well you did something, how well you presented, sold, and performed. Your unique process in your job was your weapon, secret, and advantage. The business you are now in is not about you or about what you can do. In fact, it's the opposite model. This is one of the biggest mental shifts I can help you make to help you be successful in this business. Your previous career or business was based on your efforts, your deliverables. This new business is the opposite model. It is not what you can do. It's what you can model and replicate hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of people to do. You are used to producing 100% of the results by your efforts. The beauty of this model is that you can earn 1% from 100 people's efforts, if not 1% from 1,000, 10,000, or more, instead of only 100% of your continued efforts. You are no longer the issue. The model of simple, easy duplication is. I know that this will be a tough concept for you to grapple with because before your success model was built on the unique and dynamic qualities of your skills and processes. Now the objective is the opposite. The issue is a system of simplicity so that anyone from any background, skill level, and geographic region can successfully do everything that you do. To go from you to a few, to hundreds, and then to thousands, you need a simple duplicatable system that anyone with little to no skills can use anywhere at any time. The company you joined has that system. Just don't get in the way of it. Please hear this. You will struggle more with what you need to unlearn than what you need to learn to be successful in this business. Your decades of academic and corporate-oriented conditioning will compel you to mess with the model of simple and leveraged duplication. Hey, even if you're lucky enough to have found this opportunity early in your professional life, you will still be inclined to do it your way and thus mess it all up. Let me give you some critical tips for helping you step around landmine number one. Here's number one. Forget everything you know. Be a student again. Be insatiably teachable. It's like this. Imagine buying a McDonald's franchise. Now, they have built and developed a system that has proven to work and to make money. Now you come along and say, hey, I really like ham sandwiches, so I'm going to replace the Big Mac with the Big Pig. No, you wouldn't do that. Whatever they are doing has been developed through diligent study, research, and proof. Don't mess with it. Just follow it. Number two, trust and plug into the system. The most important necessity to foster duplication is to have a system that anyone, anywhere, at any time can plug into. This is where you transfer the issue from being about you to being about the system. You don't want to do all the work. First of all, it won't work, and you will kill yourself trying. No, you want the system to do all the work. Not only will it then work for you, it will work for anyone. And that's when the magic of duplication can kick in and send your financial potential into the stratosphere. And all this is additionally reinforced in suggestion number three. Use the tools, don't be the tool. The company has agonized over and painstakingly developed the best possible tools for you to use. They have collaborated with the best experts and invested lots of money to create professionally designed and packaged materials into CDs, DVDs, 
websites, magazines, and brochures, etc. To tell the story of the business, the company, and the opportunity. Now you don't have to, so don't. You can look at it this way. The tool is the advertisement or story of the product, service, and company. The company could have paid TV cable operators or radio stations or newspapers to distribute that advertisement, but instead they are giving you the opportunity to distribute it. The company benefits by getting the advertisement distributed by a credible, trusted source, you. Your benefit is if the person you hand it to likes it instead of the TV, radio, or newspaper people getting paid, you do. And not just once, every time. Not just every time to those that you show the tool to, but every viral ripple effect from that point forward. Here is landmine number two. Lack of structure. At first, this sounds like a great thing. You are finally free. There is no commute to the same old place day after day after day. You are not relegated to a small cubicle or chained to the desk surrounded by the same four walls all day. There is no one to acquiesce to, fill out reports for, or have constantly looking over your shoulder. You don't have to call in if you're going to come in late or ask when you can take a vacation or even make a doctor's appointment. You are free. You can do what you wish, when you wish, and how you wish. And for the new entrepreneur, this is terrible. It is terrible because it is a completely foreign territory and can be incredibly uncomfortable. At the very least, the behaviors, disciplines, self-motivations, and self-accountability systems are not developed. Think about it. For most people, their entire life has been rigorously structured. When they went to school, they were told how many units were required for what degree, they were given a syllabus with detailed expectations, strict deadlines, and you were tested on your performance. Your results were delivered in black and white on your report card. When you left school and got a job, you were told where to sit, when to be sitting there, for how long, when you could get up to go to lunch, and when to be back, and what exactly you were to do while you sat there. You were given a detailed job description and held accountable for regular progress reports all the while under the constant watchful eye of someone hired simply to watch you or quote-unquote manage you. This behavior, training, conditioning, and routine was developed over 10, 20, 30, maybe even 40 or 50 years. You can see why when all of that is removed and the new entrepreneur is left standing alone without that rigorous structure, they can freak out or at the very least be completely and utterly unproductive. They try to convert the kitchen table into a desk. The bathroom becomes their new uniform. Their office mates are the refrigerator, the TV, the couch, and the ever-needy kids who now have an always accessible servant. And without your boss's stick into your ribs to deliver results, most people end up justifying their quote-unquote working by becoming product experts or making lists, preparing materials, or continuing just to get ready, aim, 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 and never fire. It would seem that they <clears throat> worked all day, but they never actually did the basics of introducing the product or opportunity to someone new, through a tool of course, or follow up on those already in process. Never mistake activity for productivity or movement for achievement. There's a big difference. Anyway, a few weeks or months walling away like that and most people go running back to the corporate bosom because even if it's a bad mother, it's still a familiar mother and one they have grown up and gotten used to for decades. Does that make sense? So, let me help usher you safely around landmine number two. Here's suggestion number one. Always start part-time. This is so important that I wanted to invite my mentor, Mr. Jim Rohn, in to help make this key point for you. For those who don't know Jim Rohn, he was considered America's foremost business philosopher and one of the most influential thought leaders in the history of personal development. Let's listen in to Jim. Now, when I first was recruited, I'm a distributor for this little product called Abunda Vida. And here's what my mentor said, Mr. Schoff. He said, Mr. Owen, you can start this miracle working business part-time. You don't have to go full-time, you can start part-time. And he said, if you'll devote to start with, let's say, 10, 12, 15 hours a week, where you'll start
stop making a profit, here's what you can now say. I'm working full-time on my job and part-time on my fortune. Because profits lead to fortune. I got so excited about that philosophy. I'm working full-time on my job, but now I'm working part-time on my fortune. I found a way not only to make a living, you won't believe this, I found a way to make a fortune. <laughs> Can you imagine what that's like then to get up in the morning? To go to work on your fortune? Not to go to work to pay the rent, which is okay. But a chance to go to work to make a fortune? And I said, right now I'm working part-time on my fortune and full-time on my job, but it won't be long until I'll be working full-time on my fortune. Can you imagine what life is going to be like? Now, here was my first goal when I started, and that was part-time I wanted to equal on my profits part-time what I was earning on my full-time job. This is called the magic of part-time. It is so thrilling for people to start working the business part-time. Because now you can work on profits, and it doesn't take very long. If you'll really concentrate on those 10, 12, 15 hours a week, it won't be long if you really do it right and learn some of the skills I'm going to talk about. It won't be long until you can be earning as much part-time working on your fortune as you are full-time working on your job. I did that in less than six months. Now I've got an incredible invitation. I found a way part-time to work on my fortune, and I'm making as much money at that as I am on my full-time job. Would you like to hear my story? It was incredible. Now, here was my second goal, to make twice as much money part-time working on my fortune as I was working full-time on my job. And I reached that in less than a year. Making twice as much money part-time working on my fortune as I was full-time working on my job. Now I've got an incredible invitation that won't quit. I found a way through a unique opportunity to work part-time on my fortune and I'm now earning twice as much money as I am working full-time on my job. Would you like to hear my story? Do you imagine anybody would say, no, I don't care to hear your story? <laughs> no. Everybody I said that to said, wow, yes, what are you doing? I said, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. Now, when I started making twice as much money part-time as full-time, here's, here's my dilemma. I didn't want to go full-time. And why not go full-time? And the reason was because I didn't want to give up my electrifying story. <laughs> right? It was so powerful, nobody could resist the invitation to at least take a look. I didn't want to give it up. And I hung on for I don't know how long until it was, you know, almost insane. So then finally, finally, reluctantly, I gave up my full-time job. But now, but now you can imagine the thrill and excitement of going to work full-time on my fortune. It was incredible. But I want you to jot down the magic of part-time. What does it take to really change a person's lifestyle? Not very much. An extra thousand a month, I'm telling you, would drastically change most American families' lifestyle. And that's why part-time is so valuable, because it very quickly changes a person's lifestyle. And here's what the change in lifestyle does. It's a great recruiting tool. One of the greatest recruiting attractions is the money you make part-time. Somebody said, you've been on three vacations this year? Says, yes, I got this little part-time thing going. Says, what's that? You bought two new cars, one for you and one for her? How did you do that? Said, I got this little part-time thing going. Your kids have got all these new clothes? Yes. All this stuff is happening? What is it? An extra thousand a month. See, a thousand a month full-time, nobody wants to hear your story. A thousand a month part-time, if it starts to change your lifestyle, everybody wants to hear your story. So the key is part-time. The magic and the attraction of part-time gives you a classic invitation for somebody to listen to what you're doing that's changing your life. Okay, with...
That great. That great context. Let me give you a couple other suggestions to help structure yourself for success as you get started. Suggestion number two: Call a family meeting. Enroll the entire family into the vision, objectives, and rewards of being successful in your new entrepreneurial endeavor. Explain what benefits the family will realize by the additional income and lifestyle freedoms. Explain how this impacts every individual's hopes, wants, and desires. Your first recruits in your new business need to be your immediate family. They don't have to be doing the business with you, but they have to be supportive in every way possible of you doing the business. You need to all be spiritually on board together to be able to navigate the rest of life's demands as a family to keep your focus on building your new business. You will need to explain the short-term sacrifices that will be necessary to earn the rewards everyone is after. Explain the extra time you have to put in, some events you might have to miss, some evenings you might be out late, and some other boundaries that you need to set inside the home when you are "quote unquote" watering their new money tree. Suggestion number three: Now set your boundaries. Create your system. Create a specific place in your home that you will do your business. Only do it there, so it doesn't take over your family home and lifestyle. And so, when you are there, you are focused and can ask the rest of the family for undisturbed time. Create set hours. This is particularly important as you build your business in parallel to working your full-time job. Take a calendar and block out key spots throughout the week. Block out the regular local meeting times, conference calls, and trainings. Block out when you will have one-on-one -on -one coffee or lunch meetings with prospects or new recruits. Block out when you're going to make outbound prospecting calls and follow-up calls. Simply figure the time you will be working the business, and then I have a very important suggestion for you: protect those blocks of time. Work during those blocks of time like your life depended on it. Your future life does. Be steadfast about protecting that time and maximizing your productivity during your allocated time. And as important, when it's not time to be doing the business, shut it down. The only way you'll be able to sustain the effort you need over a long enough period of time is if you also maintain the rest of your life along the way. If it becomes too burdensome, you will not be able to sustain it and will end up quitting long before the magic of the compound effect of your consistent effort has kicked in. Okay, let's jump into suggestion number four: chart your course, set your goals. We talked about finding your major motivation and power of discovering your why. Now we have to build a plan to help you achieve that purpose and direct that great passion. Whenever I'm asked what one skill I would attribute to any unusual success that I realized in my own life, this is my answer: learning how to set, stick to, and achieve big goals. Goal achieving is an art form. There's a big difference between the New Year's resolution or to-do list type of goal writing. And a thorough system of planning, staying accountable to, and the actual achievement process of realizing well-crafted goals. I learned this process early on, and was the reason why I was able to achieve some comparatively extraordinary things early in life: a six-figure income by age 18, seven figures by 24, and a $50 million company by age 27. I tell you that only as a testimony to the results mastering this skill can produce. This is an art form, and has been an ongoing study and refinement process for me for the past 20 years. I have boiled it down to the essential components and built a system behind it that not only helps you articulate and document your grand ambitions, but also how to architect a plan of action to get you there and build in an accountability and improvement system that guides you all along the way to help you actually achieve those big goals. If you're interested in this system for yourself. You can access it at success.com forward slash best year ever. If you get your hands on a copy, I can promise it will become the most important book you will carry around every day. And not because of what I wrote in it, but for what you will write in it. It will be the book that houses your why power and the collection of your passions, your core motivations for wanting to succeed, persist, and see this journey through. Now, with that yellow brick road directed towards your goals, your weekly management system to keep you moving forward, and the environment and time carved out to take the actions you need to take, we will have successfully escorted you around landmine number two. And this plays perfectly into landmine number three. Come in.
commitment. As I mentioned in landmine number two, the greatest benefits of this new venture are also the most sinister danger traps about this new venture. Here's the problem. It is too easy to get into this business. There's little sacrifice. There is little quote-unquote skin in the game, as renowned investor Warren Buffett puts it. You don't have anything at stake. Although I would argue you have your entire future on the line, your future financial and emotional freedom, but that never seems to be enough for people. Your wallet has to be at stake to get people's attention. And therein lies the problem. It is way too cheap to get into this business. What's easy to get in is also easy to get out. That is why many times this business has an apparent revolving door. It isn't the business that's the problem. People are the problem. Or more specifically, their lack of commitment is the problem. In most cases, this landmine is the only thing standing in the way of someone becoming successful. The business model is proven. It's already worked for thousands of others. The actual function of the business is ridiculously easy. It requires no prior education, experience, background, training, skills, or otherwise. All it really requires is commitment to see it through long enough for the business model to work and your efforts to accumulate long enough for the compound effect to ignite, which kickstarts the money machine. But still, few make the commitment to see it through. And that's all it takes. The best definition of commitment I ever heard was, commitment is doing the thing you said you were going to do long after the mood you set it in has left you. I warn you, right now you might be fired up to do this business. Right now you might be saying you will never, never, never give up until you make it successful. But eventually, this mood will wear off. You will go back to your regular life routine, mix with your same old family and peer group, and be hit with the complexity of life's obligations. It will be then that your commitment will be tested. Your mood will be different, but your commitment to staying the course cannot be. Here is the best tip I could give you on this entire audio. Are you ready? Here comes. Whatever business you signed up for, be here a year from now. Did you catch that? I'm serious. It's that simple. Be here a year from now. And in the meantime, just do what we've discussed thus far. Follow the system. Use the tools. Structure your working situation. And do the top fundamentals over and over and over again during that first year. I can tell you with great conviction, if you just do that, stay for a year and perform the fundamentals consistently throughout that year, you will have success. No joke. That's it. If that's the only thing you take away from this audio is to make a commitment and say, okay, I will do this for a year and I will follow the system and do the simple activities all year long, you will have gotten a million dollar tip. Please heed it. Now I'd like to bring in Mr. Robert Kiyosaki, yes, of the Rich Dad, Poor Dad fame, to challenge you a bit further on this topic. Robert will tell you why you and your personal development are the keys to your greater success as an entrepreneur and why you should commit to this process for at least not one year, but Robert's going to challenge you to do it for five years. Taken from his audio, The Perfect Business, here's Robert. When I came back from Vietnam, again, my poor dad said, go back to school. And for some reason, it didn't feel right to me. It wasn't what my gut was telling me to do. So instead, I went to do personal development type of work. And I found personal development is much more fulfilling, much more rewarding. But it means me getting out of my mind. It means me doing my best to become bigger than my situation. See, most people are crushed by the environment, especially in this crisis. They lose their job, they're out of money and all this, and the world crushes them. Personal development means you have to become bigger than your problems. If you're in debt, you have to become bigger than your debt. If you don't become bigger than your debt, 
and you'll never solve the problem. If you're only making, let's say, 50000 a year, then you have to get bigger than $50,000 a year. And that's what personal development is. In traditional corporations, they always say, well, you should live below your means. You'd be happy to have a job. You know, next year we might give you a 2% pay raise, but only if you do as I tell you. That's not about personal development. That's called personal slavery. You become a slave to the corporation. If that's what you want to do, stay there. Have a good life. It's not my life. I needed to become bigger than my problems. When I started my first business back in 1978, I made a lot of money. It was a nylon and velcro surfer wallet business, and I was soon a millionaire, but I lost all my money, and I found myself nearly a million dollars in debt. And what my rich dad said to me is, congratulations, he just failed. And most successful entrepreneurs will fail three, four, five times. They'll lose that many businesses, but each time you'll get smarter. He said, your first job is to figure out how to pay back that million dollars, you know? So I never declared bankruptcy. I just had to get smarter and bigger than a million dollars. And that was the best training program I ever had. I had to rebuild my business and pay people back. You see, if I got a job, there's no way I could have paid back a million dollars, not making a hundred thousand a year. There's no way taxes would have killed me. So again, it was personal development. Now that I got bigger than a million dollars, that was great. And now it's on to hundreds of millions of dollars. So personal development is simply you getting bigger than your problems. The only problem is you get bigger problems. And so today it becomes a challenge of how big my problems are because then I can solve them. Most people give in to their problems. They get smaller than their problems. And that's when life stops for them. So one of the primary reasons I recommend network marketing because it's a personal development program. You, know, you don't join and hold become rich next week. If you join a network marketing company, I strongly recommend you say, I'm gonna give it a five year commitment. I'm gonna give it a full shot for at least five years. Because whether it's network marketing or baseball or football or whatever it is, quitters never win. And most people, when the going gets tough, when the problems seem insurmountable, they quit. And that's why they'll never be successful in life. So network marketing is a very much a support group of people who want the best for you. But you have to give your best also. And so that's why I say consider it a five-year commitment that you'll do your best for five years. I can almost assure you that if you do and you give it your best for five years, you'll be a completely different human being at the end of the period. Okay, hopefully you've gotten the key point. Treat the business as a serious business, and it will reward you unlike most businesses even have the capacity to reward you. Let me give you one final warning about landmine number three and commitment. Be patient. Give yourself and the process time. Like any great endeavor, it takes time to figure it out, get good at it, and have it produce a harvest for you particularly in this business, because it's a model of leverage, meaning you earn 1% on 100 people's efforts instead of 100% of your own. There is a critical mass that needs to be developed. This business is the ultimate example of the compound effect, which by now you have figured out was the title of my last book. In the book, I model the compounding penny, a penny that doubles every day for 31 days. When the penny starts compounding, the penny on day two is just two pennies. Day three, four pennies. All the way to day 10, it is still only $5.12. Well, imagine these are your months in the business. You are now 10 months down the road, and you are at $5.12 of income. Does it look like it might not be working? It would appear that way, but what you don't know is that you have incited the compound effect. If you stick with your commitment, you will see that by day 20, it is $5,242. Still, no fortune. But if you stick with it through patience, consistency, and commitment, on day 31, that compounding penny is $10,727,418. What is important to understand is that the math between day 1 and day 2 and the math between day 30 and 31 all along the way was exactly the same. But you couldn't really see the magic of the exponential growth until it reached critical mass. That is exactly what you will experience building your business and you'll have to be willing to keep on keeping on. Maybe simply in faith, knowing that even though the results aren't visible, the compound effect is working, and if you commit consistently enough, long enough, 
the rewards will be astronomical. That is why I ask you to simply commit to being here a year from now and do the simple basics all along the way because it will appear like it's not working. But if you stick with it, eventually the exponent of the compound effect kicks in and before you know it, your rewards are a multiplier more than you could have even imagined. Now that sets up our next landmine perfectly. Because as you are journeying forward during that first year and your results aren't necessarily visible yet, you are a bit vulnerable and this landmine can really catch you off balance. Landmine Mind number four, self-image. Because most of the rest of the world has been conditioned as you have by academia, corporate culture, media, society norms, being an entrepreneur can be met with great antagonism. This is where good intending, well, sort of, friends and family try to talk you out of your new ambitions. First off, it's important to recognize some of the emotions of rejection you might feel and how it might be different than anything you've experienced before. I don't want you to be caught off guard by this landmine, so let me explain. Rejection from friends and family can hurt a lot more than the sort of rejection you might have experienced at a job. You can have a customer, prospect, or even boss or colleague reject you at the office, and you can go home and no one really knows about the embarrassing little failing. But when friends and family reject you or your new business venture, it feels more personal and exposing. That can smart a lot. When they say no to your widget at the office, you can chalk it up as, well, it's just not for them, so what? When they say no to getting into your business, now it feels like they are saying no to you. You will soon realize they are not really saying no to you. They are not rejecting you. They are saying no to themselves. They are rejecting their own inner voice that prods them to the fact that they should be doing more, stepping out, and taking risks just like you. Here's a key thing you need to know about making the shift to entrepreneurism. By doing so, you are stepping out of the herd. You are walking away from social norms and the great horde. 90% of the population are employees. That's all they've known. That is what they've been trained is good and normal. Only 10% of the population owns their own business, according to the Kauffman Foundation study on entrepreneurial activity. When you walk out of the mass of the 90%, they're going to bark at you. They're going to shout warnings of fear, danger, and hardship. Why? I think a few reasons. Number one, they simply aren't as courageous as you. They cannot get over the idea of leaving the security of the corporate bosom, their weekly employee paycheck, and their meager benefits. What you are doing just doesn't fit their model of the world, and so they're going to be communicating their foreboding warnings from that vantage point. Love them anyway, but don't let them drag you back into the pack of mediocrity. There's a story about a type of crab that cannot be caught. It is agile and clever enough to get out of any crab trap. And yet, these crabs are caught by the thousands every day, thanks to a particular human trait they possess. The trap is a wire cage with a hole at the top. Bait is placed in the cage, and then the cage is lowered into the water. One crab comes along, enters the cage, and begins munching on the bait. A second crab joins him. A third, and it's crab Thanksgiving. Yum! Eventually, however, the bait is all gone. The crabs could easily climb up the side of the cage and through the hole, but they do not. They stay in the cage. Other crabs come along and join them long after the bait is gone, and more. Should one of the crabs realize there's no further reason to stay in the trap and attempt to leave, the other crabs will gang up on him and stop him. They will repeatedly pull him off the side of the cage. If he persists, the others will tear off his claws to keep him from climbing. If he persists still, they will kill him. The crabs, by force of the majority, stay together in the cage. The cage is hauled up, and it's dinner time on the pier. The chief difference between these crabs and humans is that the crabs live in water and the humans on land. Anyone who has a dream, one that might get them out of what they perceive to be a trap, had best beware of the fellow inhabitants of the trap. Now, the human crabs do not usually use physical force, although they are certainly not above it. They generally don't need it, however. They have more effective methods at hand and in mouth, such as innuendo, doubt, 
ridicule, mockery, sarcasm, scorn, sneering, belittlement, humiliation, leering, taunting, teasing, lying, and dozens of other tactics the crabs around you use to pull off your claws or kill your dreams. Be leery of the crabs around you content with staying in the trap and wanting to keep you in with them. Number two, you make them look bad. You are a giant exposing mirror to them and your actions are being reflected back to them. They know they should be doing what you are doing, but they are afraid. By you doing it, it makes them look bad for not doing it themselves. Instead of borrowing from your strength and joining you, it is easier for them to make fun of you, try to convince you why what you are doing is dumb, stupid, bad, or foolish in the hopes that you will give up and come back to the pack so they can no longer look at you and feel bad about themselves. It is important to realize their comments are saying more about them and their fears being kicked up by your leaving the herd than it is about you and what you're doing. Love them anyway, but don't let them drag you back into the pack of mediocrity. A colleague in a prior venture I did told me about an article he read some time ago. This reality changed my view of how important other people's opinions should be of me. This article revealed that at a funeral, an average of about 10 people will care enough to cry. I thought, what? You mean I can work hard all my life trying to please others, and in the end, only 10 people will care enough to cry? It gets worse. The article found out that the number one thing that will determine the number of people who will go to the burial site with the funeral procession is the weather. It was found that if it's raining, more than 50% will not go to the burial site. I found this horrifying, actually. It's not how you live your life that will be the number one determinant. The circumstance of the weather will outrank your entire life's existence. When I heard that, my entire perspective on living for other people's favor or approval changed. Right then and there, I no longer cared what other people thought of me and whether they approved of me or what I was doing. Their rejection no longer had any power, particularly if I thought that they wouldn't even be one of the ten who would cry. Many times before making a prospecting call or after one where I was rejected, I would ask myself, would this person cry at my funeral? And most of the time, the answer was, I doubt they'd even walk across the street to even go. Why do I care what they think? That is a very liberating way to think of it. And the truth. We spend so much of our lives worrying about being rejected by other people. And most of these people will probably not even come to your funeral. If they do, they probably won't cry. And if they do and it's raining, they will probably drop out of the funeral procession altogether. I pass this important perspective forward to you. Don't let people who don't matter, matter. And then there's the great advice from our friend John Addison, co-CEO of the multi-billion dollar company Primerica gives us. Never accept advice from people who are more screwed up than you are. That's a good mantra to live by. Steve Jobs said something beautiful in his commencement speech to the 2005 graduating class of Stanford University, which was just a year after he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and given three to six months to live, which he beat, of course. Let me repeat it for you here, quote, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of other opinions drown out your own inner voice, heart, and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. ...into our last potential landmine, and that is landmine number five. The product you are really sharing is you. This is a big and important distinction to understand. You see, when you are at a job, you are performing a task. It might be computer programmer, marketing director, systems manager, network engineer, whatever. When you get into marketing, there is a giant misconception that what you are sharing is the product or service of the company or the business opportunity or financial freedom or health or hope or any number of things. But what you are really sharing is you. And this is a frightening reality for most people. 
You see, in the product representation business, and most particularly the recruiting business, you are in the attraction business. When you are telling people about this great product or great opportunity, they are looking more than they are listening. And they are asking themselves, do I want what this person has? Do I want to be like this person? Do I want to show up like this person is showing up to me? Do I want to come off to my friends and family like this person is coming off to me? In that moment, you are the billboard, brochure, and poster child of that product and the company. How does the company look if you look in the mirror? The answer to that question is what you constantly want to be improving on. You see, it's not what you say that gives your words power and influence. It's who you are behind your words that gives your words power. This is an important distinction because people are constantly perplexed about what to say. They think it's the script that matters. What you say has very little to do with your ability to influence and attract. Let me give you a perfect example. The greatest recruiter in the world had one of the worst scripts imaginable. I mean, if you were a script writer, you would find this horrifying. Here's what he said. You follow me. That's it. That was his complete recruiting script. But it was effective. Why? It wasn't what he said. It was all that he was. His name was Jesus of Nazareth. And his reputation of who he was was more important than the words he used. Just think about it. This is true for you as well. There are people in my life that if they called me and said, follow me, I would. No questions asked. I believe in who they are to that degree. And then there are other people in my life, no matter what they said, they could give me the most professionally polished, entertaining, emotionally charged, psychologically calculated, and visually stimulating presentation imaginable, but there's no way I'm following. I'm sure you know people like that too. This is why your personal development is so crucial in the success of building your business. One of the days that changed my life was a day back in November of 1994. I went to a seminar, and that was the day I met the man who would become my mentor, Mr. Jim Rohn. I wasn't even there to hear or meet Jim. I was there to meet the promoters of the event. But I needed to wait until the event was over, so I sat down and listened to this willowy, gray-haired man with the most fascinating voice and intonations lecture about the principles of success. What he said riveted me. Jim Rohn asked the audience, how many people want more? I thought, yes, I want more. Success, money, a better body, more companionship, etc. And I awaited the instructions of what to do. By that point in my life, I had experienced some moderate success already, but I had done it through sheer brute force. I was aggressive and just outworked, outfailed, and outpersisted everyone else to grab my achievements. I did it by doing, do, 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 do. But what Jim said next would multiply my income, my goal achievement, and my results. And it wasn't by doing. Jim continued, if you want to have more, you have to become more. He said, success is not a doing process. It's a becoming process. What you do, what you pursue, will elude you. It can be like chasing butterflies. Success is something you attract by the person you become. Wow, I thought. This was the first time I'd heard this twist of perspective, insight, and wisdom. Jim continued, for things to improve, you have to improve. For things to get better, you have to get better. For things to change, you have to change. And when you change, everything changes for you. Wow, those were the keys to the kingdom for me and what launched me on my constant, unrelenting, and never-ending journey of continuous personal development. And he was right. The next year, I tripled my income to over seven figures a year and within four years was a self-made multimillionaire. And I wasn't doing any more than I had before I met Jim. My doing wasn't any different, but who I was doing it was. And that made all the difference in the world. I invite you on such a journey, the journey of continuous personal development. If you want anything more in life, this is the yellow brick road to getting there. As Jim Rohn says, you want to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. In this case, you want to work harder on yourself than on your business. In fact, your business is you. The more you grow, the more your business will grow.
So, when it comes to where you want to focus your personal development and what will be responsible for your successfully making the shift into entrepreneurialism, the key is the nurturing, continual cultivating, and never-ending fortifying of your positive attitude. I hope you get this key point. Over what to say, what to do, what to learn, what you do or don't know, none of that is as important as your focus on continually developing and improving your positive attitude. It is what separates the super achievers we all idolize from everyone else. Above all other attributes, it is their attitude that sets them apart and will for you too. So, so I can hear you saying, okay, Darren, I get it, but how do you do this? How do you continually bolster your positive attitude? How do you go to work on your personal development? Well, let me give you a simple plan. Your personal development plan can be as simple as this, reading 10 pages of a good book a day, maybe just five pages when you first get up and five pages just before you go to bed. Oh, and it could also be 10 pages of a success-oriented or titled magazine, hint, hint. This is going to affect you far more positively than reading about what's wrong, tragic, or dangerous in the world by reading the newspaper when you first get up or watching the 10 o'clock news just before you go to bed. Secondly, listen to 30 minutes of an instructional audio a day. You can do this as you drive, when your hands are busy but your mind is free. I can tell you, my car does not move without two things, gasoline and an ever-present library of instructional CDs that I listen to as I drive around. As a society, we average 12,000 miles a year. That's 300 hours of feeding time. Brian Tracy taught me early in life to turn my car into a mobile classroom. He explained that if you listen to instructional CDs as you drive, each year is the equivalent of two semesters of an advanced degree in college. Think about it. In the time you spend driving, you could obtain a PhD in leadership, sales success, wealth building, relationship excellence, or whatever course, audio program that you sign up for. Now, certainly, I recommend the CD that comes free inside every issue of Success Magazine. Hey, could I be the ambassador for success and not passionately recommend it to you? Of course not. Additionally, we offer success book summaries, which culls the best ideas from three of the top books in the area of accelerated personal achievement. Each edition is also delivered in audio format, so you can listen to it in your car. Let me further explain why regular exposure to positive, inspirational, and instructional content is crucial to you making the shift into the entrepreneur mindset. It is important to understand how our mind works. Simply understood, our minds operate like a computer. Computers are complex systems, but how they work is rather simple. What you input is what it outputs. It doesn't judge or discriminate. It simply acts on the input. This is also how your mind works. It doesn't judge or discriminate the information you feed it. It simply acts on the input. I'm sure you've heard the axiom, garbage in, garbage out. This is true for computer programming and for the information you allow to program your mind. Here is how the creation process works. You get in life what you create. That is easy enough to understand. We are creative and productive beings. Our life is a result of all we have created. So, what informs your creative process? You create what you expect. I'm sure you've heard the adage, expectation manifests into creation. What you expect to happen is what your creative capacity goes to work on producing. So then, what is driving your expectation? You expect what you think about. This is why all legendary books of personal development have been focused on this thinking part. Books like Think and Grow Rich, The Power of Positive Thinking, The Magic of Thinking Big, As a Man Thinketh, etc. All these books explain how your thoughts end up controlling all the outcomes in your life. What you think about comes about. However, I'm always after the deeper question. If it's our thoughts that drive our expectation, which directs our creativity that produces our results in life, what then is controlling what we are thinking about? That would seemingly be the all-important question then, right? And the answer is simple. Whatever input 
we are feeding our ears and eyes is what is putting this entire creative process in motion. You see, your mind is like an empty glass. It will hold anything you put into it. You put in sensational news, salacious headlines, talk show rants, and you're pouring dirty water into your glass. If you've got dark, dismal, worrisome water in your glass, everything you create will be filtered through that muddy mess because that's what you'll be thinking about. Garbage in, garbage out. All that drive time radio yak about murders, conspiracies, deaths, the bad economy, and political battles drives your thinking process, which drives your expectations, which drives your creative output. That is bad news. But just like a dirty glass, if you flush it with clean, clear water under the faucet long enough, eventually you'll end up with a glass of pure, clear water. What is that clear water? Positive inspirational and supportive input and ideas stories of aspiration people who despite challenges are overcoming obstacles and achieving great things strategies of success prosperity health love and joy ideas to create more abundance to grow expand and become more examples and stories of what's good right and possible in the world that's why we work so hard at success magazine we want to provide you with those examples, those stories, and the key takeaways you can use to improve your view of the world, yourself, and the results that you create. That's also why I read several pages of something inspirational and instructional in the morning and in the evening and have personal development CDs playing in my car. I'm flushing my glass and feeding my mind. Does this give me an edge over the guy who gets up and first thing reads the newspaper or listens to news radio on his commute to and from work and watches the evening news before going to bed? You bet it does, and it can for you too. Now get this, just after completing the one-year commitment you've made to yourself to be here in your new business, this simple commitment to 10 pages of reading and 30 minutes of listening, which by the way includes taking the weekends off, we don't want to wear you out or anything, you will have read 13 books and listened to 130 hours of success and achievement material. Books and audio material on becoming a more confident leader, a more persuasive communicator, a more efficient and productive achiever, strategies on living healthier with more energy and vitality, ways to foster deeper intimacy and passion in your marriage or personal relationships, whatever. Imagine the impact this instruction can have on who you are and how you show up in the world particularly to the friends and family around you and those you come to interact with daily. This will make you attractive beyond belief and will make you a magnet to other like-minded achievers around you. So, where do you find these resources? Again, you can go to success.com, subscribe to Success Magazine, and find other books and audio programs to continue to feed and flush your mind. As mentioned before, I recommend all the Jim Rohn audio programs and certainly the Compound Effect book and audio program. You can also register to receive Seeds of Success, which is free, and it delivers great ideas, tips, and inspiration into your email inbox each week. If you want a complete list of my favorite personal development resources, you can find them on my blog at darrenhardy.success.com. As renowned investor Warren Buffett, simple as this, reading 10 pages of a <laughs> Listen to 30 minutes of an instructional audio a day. You can do this as you drive, when your hands are...